Hello guys, Dr. Carlo here, emergency physician, and this is a case discussion, really good case. The case, I almost missed something potentially very serious. This is a young patient who presented with chest pain. We do the workup, I'm ready to send it home with non-specific chest pain. Then he tells me about this other finding he has, and light bulb, something's wrong. Then we make the right diagnosis, and we get to treat him right. If you want to learn about it and learn a lot of medicine, stay tuned because we're going to watch uh, the EKG, the chest x-ray, the CT scan, and ultimately the treatment and management and disposition of this patient. If you enjoy this video, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification so you don't miss any new episodes. So let's get to it. What's the story? It's a 25-year-old healthy patient, no medical problems. Shows up to the emergency department with a chest pain. The chest pain hurts more when he leans forward like that, and he's a little bit short of breath. Uh, he has no medical history, no hypertension. His vital signs are stone cold, normal. His oxygen level is normal. We do an EKG on triage. The EKG is an electrocardiogram. It checks the heart. There's no signs of pericarditis. Those will be diffuse ST elevations or PR depressions or tachycardia, nothing. No, no extra heartbeats, no uh, delta waves of wolf Parkinson white, no ST segment elevations of acute myocardial infarction. It was a normal EKG. Then we do a chest x-ray. We do a chest AP and a lateral. And most of the time we just do a portable chest x-ray. The chest x-ray was read normal by the radiologist. To be honest, I did not look at the x-ray. Hey, radiology is the expert. If you look at the x-ray, you say it's negative. It's got to be negative, right? So I go to examine the patient. I go to talk to him. He had already had those tests. We talk about the story. I listen. I don't hear anything in exam. Normal lung sounds, normal heart sounds. Um, I push around. He hurts a little bit when he bends forward like that. He has no medical history. Then he admitted that he used some methamphetamines uh, the day before and I said well how did you use it he snorted them and I'm like well that you don't really do anything the x-ray was negative the EKG was fine you know it probably has nothing to do with it unless uh, maybe you were doing the episode and when you're going through things maybe you hurt yourself and I was ready writing the discharge instructions I was typing it in boom 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 you can go home and then he says but doctor my neck is kind of swollen and it feels like I have trouble swallowing and I'm like I don't know, but I go ahead and do my exam and start pushing around. And as I'm doing that, I start feeling this. No, it's not that, it didn't make a noise, but you just feel it. You will feel as you're feeling like uh, Rice crispy Treats, like, and I'm like, hmm, this is for real. So I go again and I feel, I, I'm doubting myself, I'm like, no, no, he can't have this. So I'm like pushing it, sure enough. Now, usually when you feel this, it's because there's air in the subcutaneous tissue or subcutaneous emphysema. And it's usually a sign of something more severe because that air came from somewhere. Usually the lungs, the mediastinum, the upper respiratory tract, even the uh, perforation of the esophagus, something like that. So I'm like, okay, we gotta do a scan. So I do a CT scan of his neck down to his chest and Sure enough, the guy has massive pneumomediastinum. Pneumo stands for air, mediastinum is for the midline structures around the heart and, and chest cavity, and he's dissecting all the way to the neck. So I'm on the phone with a radiologist, and I'm like, what? Pneumomediastinum, but the x-ray was negative. Now, now knowing that he has that, can you look back at the x-ray and see if he has that? And they're like, uh, well, knowing what we're looking for now, sure, it's there. I'm like... So we're looking at the CT scan of the chest. This is a cross section. And what you're looking at there is the chest, and you can see already the black spots. Those are air. You shouldn't be able to see that there. That big circle in the middle, that's the trachea. And these big black areas are the lungs. And this is not the greatest um, view because you can't really see the lung tissue well. But even on this X-ray uh, CT scan, you already can tell there's something wrong. So we're gonna switch over and look at the lung view. It's a different kind of X-ray where you can see the lung tissue a lot better. And here you can start seeing that air I was talking about before, that middle circle, that's the trachea going down, that big structure in the middle, that's the aorta. And you can see those black spots around, that's already air dissecting through the mediastinum. 
and uh, you can see there are huge huge pockets of air in between the heart and the pericardium that's a um, pneumopericardium and it's big and uh, it's creating that look of, of, of blackness blackness uh, that's what air looks like you can see it all the way down to the base of the heart and there here there you look at the liver on the left side of the screen the spleen on the right side of the screen and then now we're going back up so you can see that area of the pneumopericardium I and mean, you can even see air dissecting uh, at the aorta descending aorta there so the air is everywhere where it shouldn't be so now we're looking at the chest but cut from top to bottom and you can see right next to the mediastinum and the spine there's already air dissecting next to the descending aorta and you can see that air tracking all the way up next to the esophagus up into the upper airways and of course right there in the mediastinum of the patient's chest um, you can see on the left side of the screen the chest you can see the lungs you can see the air in the pneumopericardium not so noticeable there but it gets bigger and bigger as we go through the structures that's the pneumo pericardium or air in the pericardial sac and ho and sometimes when patients have this they'll have something called a Hammond's crunch every time the heart beats it crunches the air and it sounds with each heartbeat that's called Hammond's crunch but it's only present 15 to 40 percent of the patients with pneumomediastinum and you can see all the air and leakage as we cut through the patient from top to bottom multiple sections and you can see that um, CT scan is very, very great example of this pneumomediastinum. So let's go ahead and you can see, oh, there. I'm trying to show that he indeed have very small apical pneumothoraces. You can see them right there. They're just very, very small. Not picked up on the x-ray too well, but definitely on the CT scan, you can see that there. Now we're looking at the patient on their side and again looking at the patient as we cut top to bottom and going inside into the chest you can see the heart there and the pneumopericardium there you can see the lung tissue on the top part of the screen and you can see all that air that shouldn't be there at all and that's all that massive pneumomediastinum in this patient and you can see that the air tracks into the neck area that's in the subcutaneous tissue that's why we could feel those rice crispy or those bubbly type stuff in the patient's neck that's what we were talking about on the exam and that air is tracking from the inside of the thorax to the outside so anyway the question is where did that come from well most likely and we'll talk about what we did uh, that snorting of that drug creates a valsalva maneuver all over the intra uh, cardiac pressure and it probably burst an air vessel or an alveoli when that happens, air starts leaking for, from where it should be to where it shouldn't be. And it first usually leaks into the lungs, causing a pneumothorax, air outside of the lungs, between the lungs and the chest wall. But sometimes it'll dissect through into the heart area. And then from there, as it fills up with air, it'll dissect up even into the neck and back of the ears. And sometimes it'll show up as a Michelin man. So, um, in this particular patient, when they read the CT scan, they they, they question whether or not the lower esophageal wall had a crack in it or a leak. Now, the esophagus is another place where you find air because you swallow air, right? So if you crack or broke or dissected or tore your esophagus, like from vomiting or from retching, that can lead to not just air going into the mediastinum, but gastric acids and food particles. So it causes a mediastinitis. Um, inflammation of the mediastinum, and that's potentially serious stuff. I and mean, you can get really sick from mediastinitis, create uh, abscess and emphysema, and then you know, cardiothoracic surgery will open up and clean you up and clean the abscess, very serious stuff. So if he has that leak, we need to find out. So what are we gonna do? So we did what is called uh, a, a gastrographing swallow. Now normally, swallow studies are done with um, barium, a very thick, uh, liquid with metal and when you drink it and you do an x-ray the metal bounces against the x-ray waves and it stops it so you can see very clearly where these metal particles in the liquid lie and you can tell if that liquid got into a place where it shouldn't be but in this particular patient you don't want to throw metal into the mediastinum you're gonna make him sick so use gastrographing uh, a water soluble contrast material that still show up in x-ray, but if it gets out into the space, it's not gonna create that mediastinitis inflammation and those fragments being everywhere in the mediastinum. So we had him drink 
And as soon as he drank, we shot some pictures of the CT scan, which was, and it did not show any leakage into the mediastinum. That means that most likely the leak of air did not come from an esophageal rupture. And looking now at the second CT scan, first CT scan x-ray, we do see in the apex, in the top part of the lungs, a tiny little pneumothorax. Just like I said, a lot of the spontaneous pneumothorax mediastinum happen because of pneumothoraces leaking and the air leaks into the mediastinum. Now, so, so clinically, this patient's person with chest pain and shortness of breath, which he had, you know, duh. Um, and of course, uh, pain, uh, discomfort. And if they have mediastinitis, fevers and chills and very sick looking stuff. But if it's spontaneous pneumothorax or spontaneous pneumomediastinum, it usually happens in kids and young adults, usually thin people. And usually kids that suffer from asthma because asthma, <laughs> and they're doing that and that kind of break of the alveolus can happen. In young adults like this one, it usually happens from a forced valsalva maneuver. All of a sudden you're coughing really hard <clears throat> and that popping something there. Uh, trauma to the chest, getting hit on the chest really hard can pop those air vessels and leak out. Or uh, in, this, in this case, probably the snorting <clears throat> and holding the breath and it might have triggered that rupture of the uh, air vessels and leakage. Once we've determined that a patient doesn't have mediastinitis or esophageal rupture, then the treatment is very simple. It's just observation to make sure they're not getting sicker. Uh, we admit them overnight, we repeat the x-ray, sometimes repeat the CT scans to make sure it's not getting any worse. It's not gonna get much better. In general, it'll decrease in size by 1%. So if it's a 10%, it will take 10 days. If it's 15%, it'll take 15%, 15 days and so on. So it generally takes about two weeks for that pneumomediastinitis to completely resolve on its own. Obviously, a patient's not gonna be kept in the hospital 15 days. They're gonna be kept one day, maybe two. Nothing changes, repeat CT scan, repeat chest x-ray, nothing. He goes home with anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, and rest. And maybe follow up x-rays as an outpatient three to four days after that discharge. And the same will happen with young people with spontaneous pneumothoraces, and the pneumothoraces are small, and they just need to be watched to make sure that the body reabsorbs that air and it doesn't recur. Obviously, we tell people to avoid Valsalva, to avoid uh, coughing or sneezing real hard, uh, or bearing down real hard because that can exacerbate that leakage of air. What? Mm -hmm. I'm there. <laughs> so what did we learn in this video? Obviously, I nearly made a mistake, mostly because I based out of the interpretation of the radiologist, which is correct 99% of the time. Um, but we depend on them. They are the experts in radiology. But also important there is listening to the patient. Even though I was ready to close the book on that patient, let him go, he looked good, he had normal vital signs. When he said, doctor, what about this other symptom? He's take a listen and says, hold on a minute. Maybe I'm missing something. Let me just check this out. And then when you find the finding, following it through and diagnosing. Now, would something bad would have happened to this patient? Probably not. These pneumomediastinums, like discussed before, they resolve on their own, so he would have had pain for a week, week and a half, maybe get another x By then, they don't see much of anything, and he would have been discharged home um, and, and, and not even make a diagnosis. But by making the diagnosis, we make sure that we're not missing anything bad. He gets proper follow-up, he'd be monitored in the hospital, and he gets to go home, and we don't have to worry about it, going home and dying or something like that. So pneumomediastinum, we talk about most commonly in young adults and people that suffer from asthma. We talk about uh, thoracic trauma causing it. We talked about uh, a ruptured esophagus as the major thing you need to make sure they don't have and how to test for it, barium or gastrographing swallow test. And usually you do it as a, as a esophagogram, but it can also be done drink the contrast, do a quick CT scan and see that there's no leakage of that contrast material. So uh, that's it for this case. I hope you learned a lot. I certainly did. I went back and looked at the literature on it and read the follow-up care and things like that. So I learned by reviewing this. So I'm making this video. So I'm sharing the information and we all learn to get there. So if you like this video, please comment. Let me know what you liked about it. Did you like the format? Did you like the discussion? Did you learn about it? Is it gonna change your practice in the future? Hopefully you will never, um, make this mistake and you will look for these things on the x-ray that we discussed and um, you're going to be a better doctor than I was today.
potentially. All right, guys, I'll let you go for now. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. If you enjoy this video, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification so you don't miss any new episodes.